program committee in conjunction with the Lansing Democrats have decided that it would be nice for us to all find out more about this new airport expansion. And my call happened to be available, so he's going to give us the, uh, the details, or some of them anyway. Mike came to the airport as manager in 2014. So that's only four years ago, and remarkable things have happened since. Prior to the airport, he was in the Air Force mm -hmm. for close to 30 years, and after that, started or helped to start his own consulting firm, which deals with leadership development. So we're in good hands tonight, mm -hmm. and I think everybody will find out lots. So, Mike, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, thanks to Mike Winkler for setting this up and uh, uh, for all of you to come here this evening. It's uh, a lot of familiar old faces in the audience. And uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to uh, talk about the Ithaca Tompkins Regional Airport, soon to be the Ithaca Tompkins International Airport. Uh, and then I'll be happy to um, answer any questions that you might have. The Ithaca Airport goes back about a century. Uh, it's even before Mike Siegler's time, <laughs> the fellow aviator who's joined us here this evening. Um, we have a Thomas Moore Scout at the airport that's being restored. It's going to fly uh, on September 29th, on a very special day. You want to mark that on your calendars to get out there and see Tommy. A um, hundred years ago, we built more airplanes in Tompkins County than any place else in the world. And they were Thomas Moore Scouts built by the Thomas Brothers. They came to study with Glenn Curtis, and then they teamed up with industrialist Samuel Morse. They moved up here at Ithaca and they started building airplanes. Look at the craftsmanship in the airplane. Think about the skilled workforce it took to build that airplane. More airplanes than any other place in the world. It was a government design, own design. And the time came to build more. And they were outbid in the RFP by a company that had access to Sitka Spruce, which is what airplanes were made of back then. Anybody want to guess what that company was? Boeing. Boeing. Pacific Northwest, Sitka Spruce. A few years later, it was aluminum. You seen in New York. That's how close we came to being Toulouse or Seattle here. But along with the movies, uh, the airplanes moved along, but aviation did not. The Ithaca Airport settled in in what's now known as Cass Park. Uh, that's where Tommy flew from, and among other places, also Upper Alumni Field. Uh, and that airport uh, served our community through the time of World War II. Coming out of World War II, there was a great burst of aviation. And one of the things that happened during World War II was the pressure of war led to very rapid developments in aviation. And all of a sudden, the war was over, and the people who had been part of that development of aviation realized there were peaceful commercial things that could be done to unite a world with aviation. So everybody was interested in aviation, including Cornell University. They had an aeronautical lab. When I was a kid growing up in Ithaca, it was the Cornell Aeronautical Lab. And they bought a whole bunch of property up here in the village and town of Lansing to make an airport. And that airport was actually going to be a flight test center. Because at the time, remember, the Ithaca airport's down at Cass Park. Well, it turns out that that flight test center didn't really develop here in Ithaca. Instead, connections were made to Buffalo, which was a huge producer of aircraft during World War II. And the Cornell Aeronautical Lab became housed in western New York, not here in Ithaca. But government here in Ithaca decided we needed a better spot for an airport. The runway was pretty short down there, and you got to poke your nose down between the hills and bad weather. So the Ithaca Tompkins Regional Airport was built at its current site. It used to be two runways. I remember that from, from a kid. The crossing runway was closed. Um, now we have one primary runway. 7,000 feet long. Not quite. 6,997 feet long. And you ask me, why in the world? <laughs> when they built that runway, they didn't pave three more feet so that we could say, oh, I got 7,000 feet, right? Um, that's big enough to handle uh, any aircraft up to a 757, 
uh, all the 737 series, the Airbus, the kind of airplanes you fly on commonly. Not a 747, not a 777, but you know, pretty big airplanes, bigger than our market will support for a long, long time to come. And as the airport has grown, uh, so has the global connection of our community. And now I'd like to walk you through a little bit about who we are and where we're going. And again, if you have a question, um, feel free to interrupt during the presentation, or otherwise I'll give you an opportunity to ask me anything afterwards. And if I seem like I'm not focused, it's not because I came from east of the nation, it's because I had my eyes dilated a couple hours ago. I got the audio, so you can blame it on him. So here we are, the Ithaca Tompkins International Airport. Why do we need a, an airport? Why do we need an international airport? Well, we're the only strong economy in all of upstate New York. We grow by 2% a year. The surrounding counties shrink by the same amount. 15,000 people every day drive into our community to work. And when they go home and spend their wages back home, that's what sustains their communities. We really are the bright spot in all of upstate New York. And why is that? Well, sure, it's because of Ithaca College and Portland, Conference Portland Community College and Board Warner and a number of other industries and high-tech startups. But that's the big dog, largest employer in upstate New York, global Cornell University. Student population has changed dramatically since I graduated in 1968. Today, double-digit growth in students from the Pacific Rim, primarily China. Uh, the future of Cornell University, the future of our economy, the future of upstate New York depends as much as anything on Cornell University. <coughs> Global Cornell University. And that's how you connect globally in this day and age. The earth is of a size that really the only way you can get from here to there, if you're going a long ways to get there, is by air. We actually have 750 one-stop international connections and three major airlines here at our local airport. Highly unusual for a community this size. Why is that? The airlines are in business now. There used to be a whole lot of them and they were supported by the government. Then there were not so many and not so much government support. And who deregulated the airline industry? Alfred Kahn, <laughs> Cornell University professor, the father of a classmate of mine in high school, uh, went on to head the Civil Aeronautics Board. And in 1977, he deregulated the airline industry and made it a business. And they started having to look at the bottom line. Well, it's a tough business, let me tell you. In 100 years, it has not been profitable. Recently, in the last couple of years, it's been profitable. But if you look at the, over, at the airline industry over the entirety of its time, not profitable not a great investment, and yet so critical to our future. So what you see today with ticket prices and a number of other things is the result of a shakeout of the industry. And that shakeout has been good in some ways and not so good in others. The not so good is they stop caring about customers. So if you get away from Southwest and JetBlue, you get into some pretty rough, ugly territory with the airlines. That's going to change because there's just starting to be enough competition again that if you treat me badly, I'm going to go with somebody else. Okay. But they're here because of business. And the reason that they're here because of business is because it's not because we fly to Detroit and Philadelphia and Newark. It's because we fly to Beijing, Shanghai, Tokyo, and Seoul, and Frankfurt, and Paris. And that second leg, you think about it from a business point of view, those of you that are in business, instead of having 50 people and two pilots on a jet going less than an hour, now you've got 400 people and two pilots on a jet that's going for 12 hours. Much fewer number of operation cycles, a lot more opportunity to make profit, and that's where the airlines make profit. They're here because our business feeds their profit centers. 
their profit centers are the hubs. And that's why we go to three hubs that we go to. That's a good thing, because it used to be they were here for politics, and that doesn't really carry it anymore. So as long as we keep the business case strong, built around the idea that we are a global community, we should have pretty good service here in Ithaca, even as the industry evolves. Welcome to Tompkins County. We speak your language, we cook your food, you're welcome here. How many communities in this country in this political time can say that? That's a real competitive advantage for us. I didn't know, and you probably don't know, Tompkins County is the most diverse county in New York State, along with Queens. Now, I would have guessed Queens. We are very diverse here. We recently had a program called China Welcome. It was China Welcome because there was a program we could get into that was built around China, number one. So I, had, I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Number two, Double-digit growth at Cornell, largely Chinese students. Number three, our children and grandchildren are going to live in a world that is at, at best bipolar, with China and the United States being the dominant powers. We're working hard at giving that away right now, but the bottom line is we're going to wind up fighting them, or we're going to wind up free trading with them, and going through all those challenges that deregulation of the airlines brought us between two countries, and we're going to be so intertwined that it's not in our mutual interest to fight. Very, very important to build strong relationships globally, because when there are not strong relationships, I become resentful of you. And if I happen to be a military power and I'm resentful of you, sometimes I think that that's a solution. Well, I can tell you after three decades in the Air Force and being a retired general officer, it's not a solution. All it does is affect the negotiation. The solution comes afterward. The solution's the Marshall Plan, not World War II. But World War II presented us a situation where we really had little choice but to, you know, to fight. But then fortunately, we were smart enough after that conflict to put, put things back together in a more favorable way. So that's it. Welcome. Now you can't be a welcoming community if your own house isn't in order. I'm going to tell you from the time I'm at the airport, I'm going to talk about welcoming our international guests because of the tremendous contribution they make to us. They make a, a cultural contribution to us. You know, we cook your food. You, we, we like your food. We like your history. We like your stories. We like to hear about your society. You're welcome. To be welcoming, you've got to have your own house in order as well. And as a native Ithacan, I can tell you that in the past couple of years, I've been very concerned and upset about some of the incidents that have taken place in our community. You have the community you build. And if that community starts to drift in, in a direction that I don't like, a, a direction of bigotry, uh, harassment, racial slurs, you have to break the silence and speak up and say, not here, not in this community. This is our community and we have different values. So that's all part of this whole issue of international, is being a welcoming place for all people in the world. Hey, we're going to Washington, D.C. So those of you who fly out of Ithaca know that if you fly on Delta, you go to Detroit. That's like Pittsburgh in the old days, if you've been here for a while, okay? It works. Um, <clears throat> completion factor on time runs in the 80%. I can deal with that. If I've got an important business meeting, I figure I've probably got as good a shot at getting there. And if I can't, something really bad's going on, right, weather-wise. Then there's Philadelphia. Everybody's got a Philadelphia store. <laughs> American Airlines has done wonders cleaning up Philadelphia, but they can't move the airport. There's a limit to how much they can do. Philly runs in the 70s. That's enough to be noticeably different.
from Detroit. And then there's United and Newark. United is just starting to do in Newark what American has done in Philly, and that's why we're going to Washington. And Newark runs in the 60 percentile. And believe me, I talk to senior executives in, in each of these airlines on a regular basis because 60 and 70 percent completion factor on time is not acceptable. Not if you're trying to build a global community around a global economy for global Cornell. So here's the problem. Philly and Newark, the, by the way, the airline concept is you're going to go to the nearest hub. Okay, there, there you go. We're going to the three nearest hubs right now. Philly and Newark are in what's known as the Northeast Court. Washington, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, bad weather, <laughs> aging infrastructure. Both Philly and Newark have parallel runways. You've seen them when you go someplace, right? They're landing and taking off on two runways, but they're too close together to operate simultaneously when the weather goes down. But they're greedy like everybody else. So when the weather's good, they build the schedule for when the weather's good. So let's say 100 airplanes an hour can get into Philly when the weather's good. It's actually more than that. Let's say it's 100 because it's a nice number. Now the weather gets bad. Uh-oh. No more 100 airplanes an hour. So they turn to the airlines and they say, okay, which flight would you like to have land at Newark? You didn't have to go to Cornell Business School to get that answer. Let's see. I got... I got an airplane with 300 passengers and two pilots airborne from Los Angeles. And I got an airplane with 50 passengers and two pilots on the ground in Ithaca. I think I'll go with the Los Angeles airplane. And so the airplane sits in Ithaca. Oh, but wait, there's more. It's not just Ithaca. It's Rochester. It's Syracuse. It's now Elmira, because they got United back in there after losing United and American. Um, nobody's going there from upstate New York. And this is a major issue, and it's not going to change. It's not going to change because of the gauge of the airplanes. Once again, they got a couple of people who went to business school at Cornell. I think, well, 100 airplanes times 250 people, that's a big number. 100 movements times 50 people, that's a smaller number. So what I want to do is put bigger airplanes in my hub. Along comes Newark. United's redoing Newark, just like they, American redid Philly, but United's doing something else. They're biasing for big airplanes. Not going to be our market. Then they look down the road and they've got a comparable hub in Washington. And we've been agitating to get Washington service. Why? Because so many people here in this community want to go to Washington. That's a six hour drive. So Joel Moline is my new best friend, <laughs> Cornell. You know, he's trying to get down there. And so they said, How about if we take you to Washington instead of Newark? Okay, we'll go for that. Starting off at twice a day service, but growing to four times if we fill the airplanes. Just as good connections internationally, but now you got a point destination also, because very few people are going to Detroit, except for Warner, or to Newark, or to Philly. They're going there to go someplace else, right? So now we're going to Washington, and United tells me that by next spring, the Silver Line will connect to Dulles. If that's the case, you get on the metro and you're downtown, just like that. Previously, Dulles has been isolated out there. It's kind of out to the west. I can tell you from flying my own airplane in and out of New York and Washington for years, I've never had a problem getting to Dulles. And I've had plenty of challenges getting into New York when the traffic starts to back up. This is the kind of thing we're talking about. So I think now United is going to be up in the 80 plus percent reliability, and that will be a big plus for our community. Now there's Philly. I like the seas. I like Charlotte and Chicago. And we're making the case. Uh, and we're getting some traction because people look back at that upstate New York and they're saying, Jesus, you know, yeah, seven counties feeding off, six counties feeding off one, seven total. Who we ought to come to Ithaca. You know, that's where the, the money is, that's where the global connection is. So we're working on the seas. Um, I hope we get there. One thing that will help is the project to enhance the terminal. Um, meantime, we are a New York cent city-centric community. 
And there are people who are justifiably upset that we can't fly to New York anymore, even though you can get on the Cornell bus and get there just as fast by the time you go through security and do everything else. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't seem quite right, you know. People were surprised when I say my job is to create a terminal where you can fly safely, efficiently, and quickly, where you can get safely and quickly and efficiently to any place in the world. And I don't care if that's on a bicycle or on a bus or on an airplane, just as long as it works and you get where you need to go. Okay. So we are talking with United, and there's some interest uh, I mean, on a totally new concept, which is to run a secure bus. There's a non-secure bus from Allentown to Newark that United runs. But I want to seal the bus. I want to go through TSA up here, get on the bus, your bags are there. You go to Newark, you go right to the air side, they handle your baggage onto your flight, and you're gone. You don't have to go through that big choke point of security uh, in Newark. We'll see. It's, it's certainly feasible. The question is whether we can be convincing and expand people's minds to that new concept. And it's easy enough. All you got to do is seal the bus. I mean, you have to have a way to prove when the bus gets to Newark that you didn't stop at a rest stop and take on, you know, some terrorists. But that's easy enough to do. Technologically, it's easy enough to do. Up here, harder to get TSA to get their head around the fact that it could, that it could happen. So Washington's coming. And this is coming. Um, this is the new terminal. Um, what I've told people is if you want to understand the new terminal, Puff out your cheeks and stick out your tongue. Hard to do it at the same time, right? But anyway, the fact is we're expanding the baggage area significantly. You know that screening machine that's out in front of the counter? This is the only airport in the whole world that I know of that has a baggage screening machine in front of the counter. So it's going back to the back room where it's supposed to be. That's back in here. On this side, you have to walk through the lines at the airline counters. You know, and it's kind of, excuse me, I've already got my, I'm going through, you know. Well, we're going to give you a little more room so you can walk through cleanly there. And then when you get back to security, there are going to be two lines. And so there will be a priority check line for those people who travel frequently, who have been cleared and what have you. They won't, and that'll help process people through more quickly and all that good stuff. Then there's going to be a departure concourse with six gates. Now, we have six gates right now, but they're ground gates with one jet bridge. So when I say we're getting six gates and they're new, people say, well, you got six gates anyway. Well, now we're going to have four jet bridges and uh, one, two, three, four, and two ground gates. Uh, we need the ground gates because there's always a possibility that we'll get a small airline in here. You know, the, the, uh, when the pe people ask me, are there going to be more and more flights? I'm saying no. We've got good frequency right now. What changes in the industry and what's going to change here is the gauge of the airplane, not the number of flights. Because the number of flights is keyed off the number of flights at the hub. So Dulles, for example, has four pulses in a day. Four times a day the pig goes down the python. What you want to do is you want to match up to those pulses. It doesn't do you any good to come in between them because then you just sit around twiddling your fingers waiting for the next pulse. So this whole thing is kind of like a reciprocating engine. We won't get more frequency. We don't need more frequency. What we need is what we've had. 19-seat airplanes became 30-seat. 19-seat Beechcraft became 30-seat Sobs. 30-seat Sobs became 38-seat de Havilands, and then 50-seat de Havilands. 50-seat de Havilands became 50-seat RJs. The next RJ is 65. The next one after that's 90. All the smaller airplanes are aging out and they're being replaced by bigger airplanes. The question is, does our market have enough people to fill a 65-seater instead of a 50-seater? That's our challenge. It's not that we're going to get more flights, it's going to be we're going to get bigger airplanes. And that's good too because bigger airplanes are more technologically advanced and they're quieter. Uh, so this is all moving in the, in the right direction. So that's the departure lounge and there'll be food on the secure side, a lot of, a lot of nice things that'll happen uh, with this. And there's room right there for another departure concourse or you know, another concourse if we need it in the future. We're going to take the tower and put the tower over on the north side of the runway eventually and then it's out of the way and you know we've got room for the airliners. And one of the key elements in our proposal is 
going to solar power. We have proposed with Kuga Solar, which is the Millican Station, AES Kuga, <laughs> Lansing Power Plant, you know, they've got the distribution infrastructure up there. That's a huge investment. They've got 500 acres. That's a lot of room. They've got investors. That's cool. So we have proposed uh, to partner with them to, to breathe some life back into the power plant with sustainable energy in the form of solar and to power the airport with solar energy. And it'll take us a few years to convert the airport. One of the things we have to do is take the terminal off gas, largely. Still got to have some gas to cook and do a few other things. And we're putting in ground source heat pumps. And those ground source heat pumps have electrical pumps. You know, they got to have electrical power, and that's going to be solar. Some of those panels are going to be on the airport, and they're going to cover some of our parking space out there. Uh, and we're going to use this as a demonstration of sustainable solar Tompkins, uh, transitioning, how you can transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Is it perfect? No, it's not. But it's a big step in the right direction. Yes, sir. Can you keep the, the runway the lights lit all night with solar power? Nothing works real well at night yeah. with solar power. Yeah. Um, we are also uh, working with NYSEG to put a big battery on the airport big batteries the size of a tractor trailer trailer. That's partly how they manage power. Uh, there are other ways to manage power. Cuga Solar on their 500 acres has a battery field. You know, it's, it's, it's different than what you're used to thinking about. But just like the, the power plant used to cycle during the day when it was burning coal or when it was proposed to burn gas based on demand, and uh, you know, demand changes over 24 hours too. So it's it's possible to fit supply and demand together, uh, and uh, and this is a, a good way to do it. So so look for a lot of solar panels. Look for charging stations. Look for electric airplanes. Look for a customs building located near the terminal will allow what we call general aviation traffic to come and clear customs. That's everything from little Cessnas to big Gulf Streams. Uh, you'd be surprised, perhaps, as I was, how many Gulf Streams come here from China. Think about this. First of all, some of the kids that come to Cornell come from pretty wealthy background in China, right? So you buy 10 first class tickets to get to the United States and you wind up in New York City. For that same dollar figure, you can charter a Gulf Stream, put all 10 of them on a Gulf Stream and fly to Ithaca, New York nonstop. Right now, they can't come nonstop. They've got to stop and clear customs someplace else and then come to, to Ithaca. So now, if you alone want to charter the Gulf Stream, that's, that's a real big ticket for a person. But for a group of people, especially people who would otherwise travel in a you know, the front end of the airplane, it works. <laughs> so you're going to see that kind of traffic, but wait, there's more. Uh, I've, had, I've talked with Air Canada, and uh, if we get service from a pre-cleared international site, and believe me, nobody's going to fly here from Rome or Frankfurt, in an airliner. But Toronto and Montreal, maybe, and they pre-clear customs, but you can't come to an airfield pre-cleared unless there's a customs facility here. True. I suppose it's in case after the airplane departs, somebody says, oh, wait a minute, my call is on the airplane and we don't have a record. I don't know what it is. But anyway, this will allow us to have service from Toronto and Montreal if we have a market. Now, the problem with that is that the market right now is a Beach 1900, 19 seats to Syracuse, 19 seats to Rochester. So I call Air Canada. I say, how about 19 seats to Ithaca? He says, well, you know, we're, we're switching over to CRJs. It's 50 seats. That's a lot tougher market to start out with. But, but it's a possibility with this. So there you go. We'll have a customs facility. In the meantime, we're going we're gonna to reach out to our friends north of the border and say, hey, put the family in the Cessna like Mike Ziegler does and fly down here, you know, and, and stay in Ithaca. 
speak your language, we cook your food, you're welcome here, especially Lisa speaks their language. And, uh, and then go see uh, the wine country and all these other sorts of things. Wonderful weekend. Or come down and ski. You know who's interested in skiing? It's the Chinese population. They're getting the Winter Olympics. The Greek Peak is a real live hill for somebody that hasn't skied. Got a lot of good stuff going on. Okay, here's what we're going to do, just, just by bullets. Um, you know, it's going to be a modern airport. Right now it's a 25-year-old airport. Nothing really has changed. The mechanicals are worn out. When we get off gas substantially, like we don't know yet exactly, but it'll be at least at least 80%, I think, of the gas consumption right now, which relates to the moratorium that some of you are aware of out here. When we get off gas, we do heat pumps, we do solar, we save $50,000 a year in utilities. That's pretty good. <coughs> On a terminal, it's a third larger than the one that's there right now. That's what this future renewable, more efficient heating and cooling can bring to you. And that's what it looks like. Everybody was excited, mostly me, when the governor came and gave us 14.2. That's what the governor's given us, 14.2. Whatever this project costs, we've got to come up with the balance. Okay? So we looked up here and said, 22 million two years ago when I wrote the grant. So our engineering firm went back and they tore the whole project apart. They put money on all the little pieces and everything. And they came up with a number. I went home, had a glass of wine, pulled out a dart, threw it at the wall, and I came up with a number. Same number. So if you like uh, scientific forecasting or you like intuition, uh, either way, we got a number we're working with. And that's a delta of $10.5 million on top of what the governor gave us. Whoops. That slide wasn't supposed to be there, but. Um, the bottom line is that um, we've got 2.5 of that in hand, so now it's an $8 million. If we had to finance eight, we could, but we don't want to. Um, I'm going to be in New York at the end of the week uh, talking about uh, the president put in a billion dollars for airport infrastructure in this year's budget, an additional piece. We'd like $5 million of that. Um, there's also some opportunity with New York State Electric and Gas and the Power Authority to get some money for the ground source heat pump. So we're trying to get that number down to zero that we have to uh, borrow and pay for. Okay, that's what's going on inside the fence. Can I ask a question? Yes. It's a pretty aggressive construction schedule for this. Oh, They're yes. saying it's going to open next year. So will you be able to raise that kind of money that fast? better. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll be sitting there. <laughs> and I think the backup plan is, if you can, uh, fees are going to pay for it ongoing. Well, yeah, there's a there's a, a quirk in the airline world, okay? Mike's got to get somebody to bed here, so. Uh, there's a quirk in the airline world, which is that you can borrow money to keep up your facilities, and you can charge a fee per passenger. It's called a PFC or a passenger facility charge. Very common business technique in, in airports and other places. Right now that's capped at four dollars a head. Times a hundred thousand people. So that's four hundred thousand dollars a year that we get from PFCs. If we raise all eight million from grant sources, we got a problem because unless we borrow money for projects that we need, we can't charge a PFC. And, you know, four bucks a head, nobody misses it. You really need to do that. So there's some complicated financing here to make sure that we borrow probably at least $3 million to enhance the terminal. Now, what might that be? It might be a lot of things, but, it, but it's very specifically in the terminal. In other words, I can't, I can't build a new general aviation hangar and charge PFC. It's all got to be tied together. It's a big federal program. But the bottom line is if you're, if you're not charging PFCs, you're, not, you're missing an opportunity to have your customers help keep the airport up, you know, and add something. It's 
kind of head scratcher. I mean, would I take a mortgage if I didn't need a mortgage? Well, maybe I would if I could charge my neighbors. So uh, <laughs> I don't know. we'll see how that works out. Okay. Any other questions about that? I'm going to move on right now to um, this. This is uh, Northwest. We're located over here on the quill. This piece of property was purchased to protect the end of the runway from development. And then, of course, what happens is everybody says, well, it's okay. I know the airport's there. And then 10 years later, they've forgotten. They said it was okay. And then you got encroachment on airports, and people were unhappy. And I understand all that. Um, but <clears throat> this piece of property was set aside to be developed as a business park. The problem is that this business park has inventory. There's a new business park on South Hill. There's a Warren Road business park. There's plenty of business parks around. So the concept here was to make this a transportation center. And New York State DOT is going to move off the Cougar Lake waterfront down by Stewart Park and put their, res they call it a residency. And that, that's nice. I call it a garage. They call it a residency. <laughs> They're going to put their residency up here on 15 acres. And that project is independent. It was in my original grant proposal, but they chose to take it and deal with it as a state and just give us the money to do the airport. So we think about inside the fence and outside the fence right now. And um, what road is that, Mike? That quad quadrangle that you, you can go back one slide. What road is that? Um, this is Cherry's Cherry. down at the bottom. That's Warren. Warren, Warren and Cherry. Yeah. 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 This is Warren. Okay. Uh, that must be Cherry, and yeah. this up here is Hillcrest. Okay. So uh, that shows it a little bit better, but you can't see the roads. That's not what it's going to look like, but uh, you know, it, it, the bottom line is, if you're going to be off the end of a runway, uh, a garage is an okay thing to be off the end of a runway. And these facilities are not particularly environmentally intrusive. You know, the truck comes and goes, but the truck comes and plows the road anyway, and the garages are quiet. If you go down to the Tompkins County uh, garage complex sometime and sit there and you know it's like, really? You know? Or the school bus garage that's next to it. So I think this is a, a pretty good use of, of um, land that is otherwise not ideal because it's off the end of the runway uh, and it has the advantage of allowing um, development very carefully thought out um, development of the end of Cuba Lake, which is I think to all of our advantage. That's it. Um, <coughs> I'm talking about the Air Force, the airport, whatever. Yeah. yeah uh, one of the things that uh, Tom Dryden is starting to do is to relocate the comprehensive plan. Yep. So the question is that I have uh, is um, uh, how much ancillary sorts of business, spin-off sorts of businesses, that would you anticipate as you go up this transportation hub? Well, a transportation hub is a little hard to get your arms around. Uh, one thing that's going to happen is I think you and Dryden will get that property back that was dedicated to DOT in one, one form or another to add into your plan. Um, you know, the, when you when you do these grants, you know, you got to say, oh, we're going to get 550 permanent jobs and 2,500 construction jobs and everything, and that's just like, so it's hard to estimate. Uh, supporting the business and technology park is important for Tompkins County, it's important for Lansing, it's important for everybody. Um, there's also the possibility that TCAT might move up here. Uh, school districts, BOCES has talked about it. Um, you know, I think that to the degree that that activities, a locus of transportation activities develops, that opens up, each of those entities occupies property someplace in the county that is theoretically better used for another purpose, I guess is the answer. And you know, we're about, this is such a great place to be really because the, the people that work so hard for so long on concepts like sustainable Tompkins and solar and everything, really set the table for this. And this is an opportunity to make some of that happen. And, uh, you know, to, to have a, um, a public transportation system 
TCAT's are already starting to talk about going to electric buses. Uh, you know, my dad was born there riding horses. Cars were pretty new. Just think about that. You know, you got a potential of a 500 acre solar field with the, uh, with the infrastructure to take that power and distribute it, which is a, a huge cost. I mean, there's a lot of really good things that can happen from this. For them to happen, there has to be a good conversation. One of the best things about this county is our government because there is no emperor. The legislature reigns. Now, I do a lot of work in Schmung County, and it is a whole different situation down there. You have a county executive who's elected. The legislature is much less powerful. You're either on his team or you're not, and if you're not, it's ugly. Here, I don't think anybody's ever afraid to say anything. Because we have plenty of, you know, I mean, you can find you've got what, 15 legislators. It's, it's a great open conversation. And when we communicate across differences, we come up with better solutions. None of this is perfect. You know, but, but it's a big step forward toward a sustainable, affordable community with, you know, good jobs, high-tech industry, uh, future-looking industry, all that sort of thing. Plus the incredible richness of having people from all around the world. Because I'm telling you, if we don't learn to live together, we're going to kill each other off. I mean, big time. We get a nuclear war going, and, and you can forget all your dreams about the future. You keep looking at me when you talk about that. Right there in the front row. So what, what, better, what better place for it to start than here and now? And, and for, in, in, the, in the, the now or the what, you know, is where the conversation has to be. And I know people don't like airplane noise. I live on a peaceful farm in Dryden. I don't like airplane noise. Okay, but guess what? Next year, there's going to be an electric training airplane certified that flies for three hours, recharges in 30 minutes, which was a big problem before. I mean, 30 minutes is I, now I can debrief and brief another student, and the airplane's ready to go again. And it's it's quiet. It's like a fan. I about like that fan. So, you know, we're getting there. Technology will help get us there. Uh, and electricity is, is a key technology. Yes, ma'am. You had said the larger planes are quieter than the smaller planes. They are, yeah. yeah. Um, all, all the new the construction cabin, aircraft. Outside, too. I'm sorry? Within the cabin or outside, too? No, outside. Okay. Much, much more, much quieter outside. Ah, okay. yeah. um, you want to you find out how much quieter? Go down to the Elmira Airport. And um, you'll see Delta come and go and CRJs. Or, much like we have here, okay? And then a legion will take off on Thursday, and there's no doubt, it's like a military fighter left. And the reason is they're flying under a waiver, an airplane that was built in the 70s, and back then engines were a whole lot noisier than they are today. And, and in, in, our, in, in the lifetimes of many of the people in this room, uh, airliners are gonna become electrically driven engines motors uh, with a generator of some sort and they'll use battery power to you know you probably use the battery for takeoff and need a lot of power and then when you get up to cruise you'll be able to sustain the cruise it's a lot of good stuff coming technologically in terms of the environment so i'm a lucky guy i got three things drove my life i love flight i'm trained as an ecologist and I've spent most of my adult life fighting battles in civil rights. This is a wonderful place to be, folks. <laughs> you, got, you got as good a place as there is when it comes to being concerned about the environment, being concerned about your neighbor, and in my case, I like airplanes too. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll take you back to airports. <laughs> yeah. um, how much does Syracuse Airport concern you in terms of drawing people away from your market? Well, you know, Here's the thing about Syracuse. They run 10 times the passengers through that terminal that we do. I was at Syracuse Airport for years and uh, uh, in, in my military day. And um, you couldn't build an airport in a better place. You got the crossroads of two interstates. You know, I mean, you talk about the collection pool. It's a great thing. Syracuse has 10 times the number of passengers, but only twice the number of operations. Is that the we are extremely busy because of general aviation. The reason I put that first slide up about 
six surrounding counties and Tompkins in the middle is because you could extend it up to Onondaga County. They're all dying. And, you know, the government keeps pumping hundreds of millions of dollars into their economies. And thank goodness, I mean, maybe they'll turn around someday. But the airlines look at, at that slide and they say, hmm, yeah, I get it. You know, immune to, largely immune to economic cycles, steadily growing at 2%, industries of the future, education, global connection. Yeah, I think maybe we ought to stay in Ithaca. So I'm not terribly worried about Syracuse. Right. But now, I'll also tell you that, that this is not, those of you that are in business, I mean, if, if you're at Cornell and you're tenured, life's pretty good. But if you're, other than that, you know, your business can go away in a heartbeat because somebody's come up with a new wrinkle or whatever. And uh, so I don't think we'll ever rest on our laurels here. And that's one of the reasons I am totally fed up with customer service in the airlines because they're taking you for granted. And, uh, and they hear from me personally about it regularly. Uh, has there been demonstrable improvement as a result of that? About that much, <laughs> about that much to go. But we, you know, we're getting the message across. So it's a journey. You're never going to be there, Lisa. How much does the weather affect Syracuse versus Atlanta? I mean, we're a little bit different weather pattern. Right? Um, we are a different weather pattern, but we don't have, we're not immune for sure here. Elmira's largely immune, except for fog, okay? Well, I guess which airport in upstate New York is open more than any other? Ithaca. Closed for two hours in the last three years, and that was an ice storm that just overwhelmed us. Two hours. That's why Southwest Airlines holds us as their alternate, because they know that every now and then the clouds will be too low, not that often, but sometimes we're below minimums. We can't do a damn thing about that, but our airport's going to be open. And, uh, and we have a, we have a tremendous crew of, of people, uh, all 15 of us, running the airport. Uh, the, ops, the ops folks are ops firefighter people are terrific. Mm -hmm. yeah, my two deputies, uh, you probably don't know Roxanne Noble, but she does finance and administration. Josh Nally, big name in Lansing, firefighter, EMS, all that sort of stuff. They turned around a $200,000 a year loss into a uh, million dollar surplus and a $200,000 a year plus uh, with the same operation. And the reason is because we talk every day about business and how do we run this as a better business. Let me tell you about pickup trucks. Josh, Josh is terrific, came off a farm, it's not a bad place. Buy a pickup truck off the state list. Ah. Buy, you know, big volume buy, pickup trucks cheaper. Drive it under warranty for three years, sell it on auction, and you make money. Why isn't everybody else in the county doing this? So we're making money on three-year-old pickup trucks that bring more to auction than we paid for them. Now, we had to order them pretty fancy. Uh, so we, we buy them with, we sold a bunch of junk. We sold, I don't know. $300,000 worth of stuff that was laying around the airport at auction. <laughs> and we bought the first pickup truck, and it's loaded. And three years later, we just auctioned it off, and we got more than we paid for it. Now, that's a good way to run a vehicle fleet, because for three years, it was paid for under warranty. So we're, and, and by the way, we're an enterprise unit. We don't take any tax, any general fund tax money. It's all, it's all generated as part of a business. Which is different than Elmira. Elmira and Binghamton take a million dollars each. Okay. Cost per passenger, all included. Whole, whole airport divided by number of passengers in Binghamton is $95. In Elmira it's $45. Here it's $32. And that's just that's just management. We got we got good people out there, believe me. Yes, sir. Why is there such diverse uh, ticket pricing? You're almost afraid to ask the person next to you because if they pay more, you feel good and they feel upset and vice versa. So a couple of years ago, Shell and I are going to go to Florida. And um, and I looked at the prices out of Ithaca and I said, Ew. so I ordered a disguise and I booked out of Syracuse. <laughs> and, uh, and so with two weeks to go, I mean, it was huge difference. 
well, two weeks to go, I thought, you know, Jesus, I, I wonder what it is. So I go and check again. Paying the $200 change fee, it was cheaper out of Ithaca. Now, I'll tell you what I think is going on. I don't know how many of you are uh, systems engineers, but you know, if you've got uh, multiple alternators or generators or whatever in a system, you got to have something that's balancing them out. You don't want this generator to carry all the power and that one to be sitting there idle. And I think they're doing that between their markets. And why do I think that? Because I would if I were them. So I'd take a look at Elmira, Binghamton, Ithaca. Well, not so much Elmira and Binghamton now. They've lost so much service. But Syracuse, you know, and I'd say, oh, man, Ithaca airplanes are full. Keep the prices up and drop the prices in Syracuse. Move some of those people up to the airplane that's empty. That's load management. It makes too much sense. And with computers, it's way too easy. So there's not much we can do about that, unfortunately. Um, and the other thing that drives prices to some degree is the kind of traffic you have. And um, let me give you an example. Ithaca is 50-50. 50% of the people coming to our airport, 50% of our traffic is coming to the airport from someplace else. Elmira is 30%. 70% of the people going through Elmira are getting on Allegiant, they're going to Florida, they spend their money and when they're broke they come home. That's not economic development. So, you know, we're set up in a, in a different way, and, and it's not the way that attracts the LCC where people don't fly a legion for business unless they're doing something in Tampa, I and mean, then they're, they're lucky to get a cheap ticket if they get there. Um, <laughs> but, so there's a lot of that going on, and it used to be you could say, well, buy, you know, buy six weeks out, or you can't say that anymore. Uh, what would be really good? I don't know if you've ever worked with eBay, but there's this thing called Auction Sniper, where you can mm -hmm. tell Auction Sniper how much you want to buy for. And as it gets down to the last couple seconds, you know, as soon as you could win, it, it fires in for you. It would be nice to have a system like that with the airlines, where you could say, okay, look, I'm going to fly out of it, because here's what I'm willing to pay. And you watch it 24-7, and, and you strike when when the time's right, but there's nobody that's been able to do that so far. So, yes, ma'am. Oh, I thought I saw a hand up. No, I just stretched. Okay. Just get the leads yeah. Susie? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering what you think the, in, the number of employees will get to once the expansion has come to come to be. How many employees, like at the airport? Well, we have 15 people that are county employees on staff. And we have multiple contracts, cleaning, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the ambassadors, uh, and what have you. That's not a bad way to be because that, that allows you to manage the workforce. If, if, they're, if you come on hard times, you're not dealing with county employees who are essentially tenured. Um, in terms of employees at the airport, it'll probably go up uh, some, although I will tell you that United and Delta are handled by a contractor called Delta Global Services. And one of the customer service issues that I have is I, I almost never hear about a problem with American. American has full-time employees that have been there for a long time. They're trained. They aren't always happy, but they're trained. Delta Global Services has 40-plus people that are hired for the absolute minimum amount of time that they can. And, so, and, they, and mostly they took the job because they wanted the travel benefit, which is part of a compensation, if you will. But they're not very well trained. And I've raised hell about that because when you come in to fly out of our airport, I want somebody that knows what they're doing, particularly, as I said, look, if you know that Newark is trouble and you care about customers, wouldn't you think ahead a little bit and say, well, I guess I better make sure people are really trained on rebooking and options here because it's going to happen more than I'd like, more than would be the case if you were Chicago or Charlotte or Pittsburgh or whatever. Um, so I think that in terms of numbers employees, I'd just like to see that 40 become 20 full-timers that are really committed to customer service, but that's their business and they rent space from us. I'm being very frank, those are some of the challenges we see. And, and the bottom line is, it's all Ithaca Airport. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm responsible, and that's why I call people regularly. 
Yes, Mike. Yeah, two questions. One is to follow up on Dan Beaver's question about timing. So it's starting in the fall when it's supposed to end. Second question is about operations. You got $25 million pouring in. But what's the increased operational cost on an annual basis, to, say, for the customers? And, you know, Okay, first thing is uh, when the governor makes these upstate airport development awards, there's a tight timeline. And we have to be done by the end of 2019, but they really want it done in the fall of 2019. Okay, that's really a good thing. Those of you that have worked with public works projects know that they have a tendency to drift to the right, and nobody has a sense of urgency. There's a sense of urgency about this, which is good. I, I like that. Um, and I don't think we'll miss too much because of that sense of urgency. And I, sometimes you can go too fast, but I think we'll be okay. Uh, partly because we planned it for two years while we were trying again to come here and write the check. So we were, we were way ahead in that regard. Um, the second question was how much more is the airport going to cost? Operationally, like the customs facility is obviously going to be ongoing. I think it's going to be flatlined. Okay. We're at 3.2 million. I think we're going to stay at 3.2 million. It's going to save fifty thousand dollars a year on utilities. Uh, we're going to, you know, I just, I, I really think that we will inevitably will grow a little bit, but maybe from three point two to three point five or something like that. I just don't see, as long as we keep managing the way we're managing, um, the big ticket items right now. I mean, we're going to save fifty thousand on utilities. We're going to save over a hundred thousand on maintenance on the building. You know, and, that, and at that, we've been putting duct tape on the cooling towers, waiting to, rather than replace them and then replace them, waiting to get this money. So there's a lot of efficiency involved in this, which is good. And then there's the solar power, which comes to us under a different formula. Um, so I will come back in a couple of years and tell you, but right now we're projecting a flat budget. So the airport administration is going to oversee customs then? Is that a whole the airport administration is responsible for funding customs. Okay. Customs is customs. They're okay. federal agents. Yeah. But they... That line is going to be in your budget. That's correct. Okay. And yeah. that's, that's not there are road. some airports where that line is in the federal budget. Yeah. They didn't choose us to be an international airport. We did. Yeah. So we are what's called a user fee airport. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so are the renovations going to disrupt travel in the next... Are there any... Are, are there renovations going to Travel. Well, the disruption of travel is uh, we're, we're going to be open, you know, around 65 days. You're going to have to walk through a sheetrock corridor instead of a bride yeah, for a short it's period of time. But, like, you know, we said it's going to be over with by the fall of 2019. But it's not gonna Actually, the, uh, going back to the picture of the terminal, the departure, con or keep calling it departure, the concourse, departures and arrivals, that's going to be done by a year from now. So that'll be the worst of it. And then the rest of it, uh, the baggage area is kind of behind the wall. Um, widening the, the entrance, there'll be some walkways. But I, we're a great deal of efforts being put into trying to keep the ops tempo up in spite of some major construction. Yes, ma'am. I'm a little concerned about the flight path. Um, between 1990 and 92, I looked around Tompkins County for property. Yeah. I come from New York City. I was in the flight path of LaGuardia. Yeah. So when I came up here, I didn't want that. I know. And for, I've been there for 26 years at my house. It's just off of um, uh, Route 34B, and two miles past the schools. We never had planes coming in over our homes. And now all of a sudden, I mean, I can look straight up and there's the jet. Oh, my God. So I'm concerned about that. Yeah, no, I, I certainly understand that. It is that. noisy. I mean, nothing, nothing has changed chart-wise about flight paths. Mm -hmm. And the total number of operations will rise slowly over time, but not dramatically. Um, tell me again where you're located. I'm on um, Dandyview Heights, so it's two miles past the Lansing Schools on the left. Just, okay. You know, sort of down near Salmon front. Creek area, or that's sorry. a little further that way. Oh, yeah. 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 And I live another yeah. four it's miles out and have the same thing. They're yeah. And right, right. Well, we right never out. had that before, so I didn't. I wasn't aware that there was such a change. No. Change. You know. I mean, they used I'm to not aware. Water. I'm not aware of any air traffic changes with regard to vectoring, mm -hmm. which 
could change a path. I, I could tell you that the published approaches in here haven't changed. They've been the same way for, you know, 30 plus years. Um, Where about you live? Hey, I live on Swayze Road, which is just before Lansing Station. Yeah. Let me, uh, I'll and ask, about like I'm going to ask Elmira approach about that. Um, they're the ones that have the radar that vectors mm -hmm. you until you turn on the final approach. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not aware of them changing any flight paths, but on the other hand, I'm not sitting in your backyard. So and I some can't. of them come in quite low. I mean, it's the point where you well, they, by the time they're there, they, they yeah. would have well, to be. Well, a lot of them do. I mean, there, there's a big difference. And then I think it was last month, and a, a number of us noticed this. It came in, usually they come from the northwest of our homes. This came in from the south, southwest. It made this very acute right turn, and it was very low. And we were all concerned. I mean, well, was, you're, you're going to see some of that, and, and, and I'm speaking as a pilot for... Mm -hmm multiple decades. Uh, we try to remind people that while well, it's a beautiful picture from the airplane, mm -hmm. you know, if you're down there on the ground, I look, I live I live a beam the outer marker on the approach to the primary runway, so I I get airplanes mm -hmm. going by. Yeah. They're like a half mile right there. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'll I'll ask Elmira um, another thing that's changing hasn't changed yet, but Elmira's gonna be decommissioned in Wilkesbury is going to take over a larger consolidated mm -hmm. approach, and uh, but I'll ask them if they've you know if, if anything has changed because they got a radar scope and they you know they meet periodically and say well you know so maybe I don't know. Okay. Thank you. But sometimes they'll put planes. The controls will put planes on like a three sixty if they need them. Yeah. To, but you know, we don't um, usually get that. Time. We, we like don't, if you need them yeah. just going around. Yeah, they we might don't be. have that over us. We have them coming in. Yeah. And except for this one, the uh, the airliners are coming from where they came from, mm -hmm. you know, Detroit and Philly, and mm -hmm. so I. I, I was just wondering if it was because you. I know at one point you uh, didn't you lengthen the runway or if it would do something. Uh, the runway was lengthened uh, like decade or oh, yeah, ago. and that's it. Yeah. So I I didn't understand. Nothing's why changed. All of a sudden. Nothing. There's there's nothing about the airport per se mm -hmm. that would cause that. Mm -hmm. Whether or not. Some air traffic control consideration move the boundary from Syracuse a little bit or something. I don't know, mm -hmm. but I'll ask and, and see what I can find out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, are you? This more aviation related. But are you saying that Elmira Approach is being decommissioned or the VOR? No, the approach. And does that mean Binghamton's going away as well? My understanding. I haven't received anything official. My understanding is that they're going to roll up Binghamton and Elmira and Wilkesbury and make a, it's like what they did at Washington a few years ago when Potomac and somebody else came together and became Washington. You know, that it checked, that with today's technology, you, you could have approach control in Southern California running the airport in Ithaca. And, but the, but the, the, thing, the reason I'm interested in this is because Binghamton radar sees all the way down to the ground. We should be using Binghamton approach. But Elmira is our approach, and they can only see down just a pattern altitude. And I say, well, why is this? And the answer is, well, you know, we're a union shop, and we got this and that, and we can't take business away from Elmira, and, you know. So <laughs> I'm hoping that when Wilkesbury comes in, because it's all combined, they'll just use the radar that works instead of the one that doesn't. Sometimes in the air, Elmira can't see you either. Right. You, you got, got one, one more. more question in the front there, and then uh, yes, we can ask questions. Do you foresee back. any new airlines coming in? Like the well, we're lucky to have the, the big tree. I, I get region. more worried about somebody leaving. Um, we've had some discussions with some smaller airlines and some smaller service providers. We have a, a small market to Boston. Um, we had a market to Washington that all of a sudden United's jumped on. Um, you will see, as we have seen over time, that as the big three concentrate on those hubs and start leaving more communities behind, somebody like Mike Peach will say, I can start a Mohawk Airlines and make money at, here in Ithaca. And you'll see that happen. So chances of a smaller airplane, and we had a company come and 
pitch us uh, two months ago about direct service to Baltimore. It's a really nice idea. It's a U.S. airway, it's an American hub, it's also a Southwest hub. They wanted to fly the little caravan airplane, which is what FedEx flies, that little single engine Cessna. That's a good little airplane. How many of you want to get on a single engine Cessna? Well, <laughs> maybe for a 40 minute flight to Washington. Uh, but then I started checking around and their reliability is below 50%. <laughs> yeah. Grow up and then come back a little bit and come back and see us. But there are some companies now like Contour that are putting a regional jet at a specific site to serve a specific leg. And there's certainly a possibility that that could happen here in the future. And it would probably be Boston. Uh, there's, a, there's a market to Boston, but it's not a big market to Boston. Mm -hmm. Lisa wants to sneak in. One last question, then be quick. Um, I'd love to see a few words about women in aviation. Is that right? Women in aviation, the Project? Sure. Lisa is president of our local chapter of Women in Aviation. Aviation in general, whether it's pilots or mechanics or dispatchers or anything, is really suffering from a labor shortage right now. It's also an industry that is someplace in the single digits with regard to women. The last time I checked, made up 51% of the population. So there's a tremendous opportunity here for young women to think about an industry that has not traditionally been part of it. And she's at the forefront of trying to get that word out and get, get our young people considering the fact that if you go into aviation, you probably have a job for life at this point, which was not true 20, 30 years ago, and particularly not true 20, 30 years ago if you were a woman. Great. Yeah, thank you. So I'm a member of the East Hill Flying Club. Um, and I also head a chapter of Women in Aviation International, which is based in Dayton, Ohio. There's about 12,000 members worldwide. We have 113 chapters, and one is here in the Finger Lakes, chapter number 84. Um, as president of the chapter, I organize bi-monthly meetings at the East Hill Flying Club. Um, Mike has been a wonderful mentor to me and the group. Um, it's op the, the chapter is open to everyone. Uh, women and men, and not just pilots, um, anybody with an interest in aviation. The objective is to do outreach uh, to women and promote and encourage um, women in, in the field um, of all ages and all of all aviation interests. So far we've had presentations by a woman who uh, is a retired 767 captain who started on gliders um, in Elmira. We also had a woman who is a banner tow pilot and she's very good at flying tailwheel. She flies biplanes. Our next presentation will be with a 15-year-old young woman from um, Addison, New York, who's a glider pilot. And she sold it on a glider at age 15. She has about 50 hours. So um, I'm open to all you know ideas for presentations. Um, but I would just say you're all welcome. Um, you can contact me through the airport through my call. Um, I'm also wearing another hat today tonight, which is that I'm serving on the Ithaca Aviation Heritage Foundation also. And this is a project dedicated to restoring the Thomas More Scout airplane, which is very rare. It was built in Ithaca. There were about 600 built, only 60 to survive, and only one other is airworthy. And this has been painstakingly restored over a decade. And it will fly for the first time in, since the 1930s, I think, on um, September 29th, 2018 at the airport. We have a wonderful event coming up. It's going to be Apple Festival weekend. It's free, open to the community. Um, and we have a really expert pilot coming from Rhinebeck Aerodrome. And there's only about three or four people in the world who can fly this kind of plane. Um, and he's going to be flying it. So I have postcards. You're all welcome to that. But just keep that date in mind. September 29th is very rare and unique opportunity for our community. So, Women in Aviation, Tommy Project, and Airport. <laughs> thank you. I want to say thank you to Michael. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks to you, and uh, we're always happy to work with you. Airport Day, September 15th. E17 will be here for four days, uh, so you'll see a foreign airplane flying. Any questions you didn't want to ask in front of the group, I'll answer now. If you have lots of refreshments, please take your refreshments home. I need to get all three.